Good day. My name is Peter Betteridge, and I'm going to present my research project, which was a theoretical project to explore combining Holnagel's resilience assessment grid with a learning from events model in order to develop a tool for organizations in the process industries to assess their potential to learn from events. Having spent my career working in the process industries, I've read many accident investigation reports which exhibit many similarities. At the start of this project, I had a strong feeling that the process industries did not learn effectively from events. I started this research by investigating whether the literature supported my views about learning from events in the process industries, and it did. Although the process industries invest significant resources in hazard analysis and risk assessment, they continue to experience major accidents with little evidence of learning. This observation is supported by the investigation reports into fatal accidents across many sectors of the process industries, including refining, mining, oil and gas, and food processing. Some examples of investigation reports which have highlighted failure to learn as a contributor include the Texas City refinery explosion, the Pike River mine disaster, the Macondo blowout, the Piper Alpha explosion, the Longford gas plant explosion, and the Port Wentworth sugar refinery explosion. My research questions were, what factors contribute to effective and ineffective learning from events in the process industries? And could a learning from events or LFE model be combined with Holnagel's RAG approach to help the process industries assess their capacity to learn? The project will focus on learning from events as opposed to learning from other sources such as audits, simulations or benchmarking. And it will also concentrate on learning from events within the organisation as opposed to industry-wide learning. After confirming the learning from events problem, which the process industries face, I wanted to explore whether underlying views of safety could be limiting the efforts of the industry to learn from events. Holnagel proposes two ways of thinking about safety, traditional safety, which he calls safety one, and a more contemporary view, which he calls safety two. He defined five of the key differences between the two as shown in this table. I'm not gonna read the whole table However, I wanted to draw attention to two of the aspects. Firstly, safety one defines safety in terms of minimizing what goes wrong, whereas safety two defines it in terms of maximizing what goes right. Secondly, safety one believes that accidents occur due to failures which propagate through a series of cause consequence relationships to result in the accident. Safety two, on the other hand, believes that accidents are too complex to be described by linear cause consequence models and that the causes of accidents are the very same causes of successful work. Keep these safety one and safety two concepts in mind for the next couple of slides, where we'll investigate the prevailing paradigm of process safety by looking at how process safety is typically defined in the process industries and how the industry thinks about accidents. On this slide, we have several definitions of process safety from professional bodies and industry bodies from Australia, the UK and the USA. The Institution of Chemical Engineers defines process safety in terms of prevention and control of incidents with potential to release hazardous materials or energy. The Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association describes process safety as the prevention of unintentional releases of chemicals, energy or other potentially dangerous materials. The Australian Institute of Health and Safety describes it as preventing incidents that while having a low likelihood of occurrence are associated with severe potential consequences. And finally, the Centre for Chemical Process Safety suggests that process safety reduces the frequency and consequence of potential incidents. Process safety seems to be defined in terms of the absence of unwanted events. Another clue as to how the process industry thinks about safety can be found by looking at the tools which it utilises to manage risk. Many such tools are used, and some examples could be hazard and operability study, bolt tree analysis, event tree analysis, quantified risk assessment. These tools tend to focus on identifying causes and reducing unacceptable risks. They assume accidents result from linear chains of directly related failure events. This implies that adverse outcomes can be predicted by starting from possible causes and working forwards through a chain of linear cause-consequence relationships as is done in most risk assessments. 
Tools based on linear accident models are prevalent throughout the process industries. And this is due to the tools being so well established and familiar to professionals within that industry. And whilst they may be appropriate for assessing physical equipment failures, contemporary safety thinking is that these tools are not appropriate for ensuring safety in complex socio-technical systems such as the process industries. Leverson believes that these tools are too simple and do not include what is needed to understand why accidents occur and how to prevent them. Linear accident models like these are another characteristic of safety one. So the previous two slides might tell us a little about the prevailing paradigm which underpins how we think about and manage process safety hazards. Defining safety by its absence does not tell us how to maintain or improve safety and it aligns with safety one thinking. And many of the tools used in the process industries are also characteristic of safety one. So then can other safety paradigms offer us an opportunity for the process industries to improve their ability to learn from events? The safety two concept introduced earlier is closely related to the concept of resilience. Resilient performance improves many aspects of business performance, including but not limited to safety performance. Resilience is concerned with maximising success under both expected and unexpected conditions. And Holnagel said that a resilient system adjusts prior to, during or following changes and disturbances so that it can continue to perform as required after disruptions and in the presence of continuous stresses. We should note that resilience is not something that an organisation is or can be. It is a capacity that an organisation may have as a result of what it does. Resilience is not a singular concept either, it's multifaceted. Holnagel defined it as comprising of the potential to monitor, which is knowing what to look for, the potential to anticipate, which is knowing what to expect, the potential to respond, which is knowing what to do in response to regular or irregular changes or disturbances, and the potential to learn, which is knowing what has happened and learning the right lessons from that. Holnagel developed the RAG, or the Resilience Assessment Grid, as a proxy composite measure for resilience. You can see an example of a RAG here on the left side of the slide. RAG measures each resilience potential in turn and uses a radar plot to visualise the ratings for each of the four resilience potentials. The assessment is typically done using a set of diagnostic questions to which respondees apply a rating on a Likert scale. It's not intended to provide an absolute measurement of resilience. However, it is a very useful way for an organisation to track over time its potential for resilience. In addition to the RAG plot, which was shown on the previous slide, the technique also lends itself to generate an individual radar plot for each of the four resilience potentials. In these plots, the spokes represent a specific factor for the particular resilience potential being assessed. This allows the analyst to determine which factors are undermining performance in a specific resilience potential. Before I go into the detail of the approach which I took, I just wanted to give a quick overview. I can really break down the methodology I adopted into three main steps. Firstly, I needed to establish a learning from events model to act as a basis for the assessment tool. Secondly, I needed to define the factors which contribute to effective or ineffective learning from events and to map those factors onto the different steps of the learning from events model. And lastly, I developed a question set for each step of the LFE model, which was based on the factors from the previous step. Historically, the focus of learning from events has been on the investigation step. However, in the last decade, recent research has shown that effective learning from events is much more than good investigations. There are several sequential models of learning from events in the literature, which highlight the important steps of the LFE process. Inspired by the models in the literature, I established the model on the right-hand side of this slide to be used in this work. The first step 
is event reporting, where the workforce observe an event or situation, recognise that it should be reported, and subsequently report it in the appropriate system. The second step is classification and selection, where reported events are classified according to certain criteria, and a selection is made as to which events should be investigated. The third step, investigation, is where an event is analysed in further detail to determine the causal factors and identify any lessons to be learned. Broad learning refers to the communication of lessons learned to appropriate stakeholders within the organisation and the subsequent acquisition of knowledge by those stakeholders that's useful to them in their role. Implementation is the stage where the organisation decides which of the learnings from the investigation merits some action to be taken to prevent future incidents and then enacts those actions within their workplace. The final step is evaluation, where the organisation checks that the actions are carried out and that they're effective, and more generally that the LFE process is working as intended. The following slides will summarise some of the main issues associated with each stage of the LFE process, which are described in the literature. The second stage of my approach was to identify those factors which contribute to effective and ineffective learning from events and to map these onto the appropriate LFE step. So the next six slides are going to summarise those factors for each of the LFE steps. This slide summarises six factors which were found to impact the first step of the LFE process, event reporting. As you can see, the first of the issues is the reporting system, accessibility and usability, including things like the data requirements and the, any paperwork load that there is associated with it. The second factor is the scope of the reporting system. So what needs to be reported and, and making sure that that's specified and very clear to the workforce. Otherwise, we don't get the right reports into the system. So therefore, we can't learn from them. Thirdly, the reporting of no harm events. So no harm events or near misses um, or even instances of normal operations, which we can learn from, should be reported. Um, the detail level of those events is, is important. Um, if they're not detailed enough, then the, the, the next step, which is classification and selection of those events, cannot be done properly. So they need to be detailed enough to allow um, an understanding of what actually happened. Time availability is another issue. Um, the workforce need to have sufficient time to report events into the system. If they're left to do it after their shift finishes, the chances are it won't be done and your, your reporting is going to be very um, incomplete. Management feedback and promotion are really important to underpinning a healthy reporting culture. Um, so managers need to promote regularly the importance of reporting and they also need to feedback to the workforce about events which have been reported. This slide summarises the factors which can impact the event classification and selection step of the process. Okay, so firstly we need to think about analysis and maybe not all events will be fully investigated but they should still be subject to some analysis. So therefore the classification has to be done in such a way that it permits sensible analysis. So analysis can help provide some idea of underlying trends in the data, such as particular causal factors um, or repeat events. Another aspect which can impact your um, ability to learn from events is, do you have any documented criteria for selection of events? If you don't have that, then the selection process is gonna be subject to, to bias and perhaps the events which are investigated are not necessarily going to be the most appropriate. Typically, the selection criteria in many organisations will be based on consequence. Um, however, the research does suggest that this isn't always the best case and that alternatives should be considered. Closely related fact, uh, closely related factor here is, is the selection of uh, no harm events. So most organisations do tend to investigate only events with consequences and typically significant consequences at that. However, the literature is quite clear that learning opportunities are not really related to the consequence of an event. 
and there are many different examples of no harm events which should be selected for investigation because they hold just as much learning as events with significant consequences. Four factors were identified which impact investigation analysis, which is the third LFE stage. Those factors were a failure to identify the underlying causal factors during the investigation. Investigator competence. So investigations are not entirely objective, they're subjective, and they do depend on the investigator's background, skill set, knowledge, and the accident models they believe. Um, and there is a requirement really that investigators should not just be trained in the in the investigation tool itself, but more broadly in human and organizational factors and non-technical investigation skills as well. Oversimplification during the investigation is, is a big issue. Um, Carol refers to uh, root cause seduction, where the investigators uh, are trying to find the one root cause of an event, which significantly um, oversimplifies an event and reduces the learning. Um, the investigation um, is often limited in terms of its addressing of management factors. In some organisations, at least, uh, it might be culturally very difficult for the investigation to identify causes at the supervisory or management level. OK, so here we've got three factors which can impact on broader learning. Firstly, stakeholder identification. So who do we want to learn from? A particular event. Trying to make all people in the organisation learn all learning points from all incidents is, is not really um, feasible. So we need to consider who we want to learn what and identifying stakeholders is a key part of that. Secondly, the detail level. Oversimplification of learnings to try to get one pages which are easy to distribute um, often removes a lot of the context and really reduces the amount of learning that's possible. Passive learning is, is, a, is another issue. Um, reliance on uh, electronic communication of uh, learnings uh, really limits the learning that's possible. We, we, we need to look for opportunities for face-to-face -face communication and more importantly, um, social participation from the people who we wish to learn from the events. The implementation step is when the findings from the investigation get turned into recommendations and actions and take effect in the field as those are recommendations are implemented. From the, in, from the literature I identified six uh, factors which can impact implementation, starting with ownership. So um, a lack of ownership is one of the um, ways which the literature identified that recommendations don't get implemented. Um, the other or the next one down it, there is cost. Um, rejection of recommendations on cost is probably inevitable. Um, when it happens, though, it should be based on a formal cost benefit analysis. Implementation delays uh, uh, also um, can contribute to implementation being ineffective. So really, that is something which needs to be uh, regularly monitored by management and management buy in throughout the LFE process. Is, is essential. Sometimes motivation is lacking for um, certain groups in the organisation to you know, fully implement some of the recommendations from um, investigations. That can be um, helped by extensive communications around the recommendations to, to make the workforce buy into those. Um, prioritisation, all actions are not equal um, and, and a good prioritisation programme prioritising based on risk or on consequence or, or, or on, on some other measure uh, can help actions to be implemented in a timely um, way. Specificity. Um, often actions don't get implemented because they're too vague. They need to be standalone, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time bound. The final stage of the LFE model is evaluation. This is a step which is often absent. There's four factors identified relating to evaluation. The first is that an evaluation process should be established. When recommendations are identified from an investigation, and even if they're commenced, they may not be fully implemented 
or evaluated. So organisations should have a process to evaluate the recommendation implementation. And the second factor here is, is a build on the first factor. Because even well-intentioned recommendations can fail to help or have unintended side effects or make things worse. So the evaluation shouldn't just check that the recommendation has been carried out. It should also do a check of whether the recommendation has been effective in what it was trying to achieve. The third factor is LFE effectiveness. So in addition to looking at the recommendation implementation and effectiveness, the evaluation step should evaluate all stages of the LFE process. It should specify where the LFE process has failed and it should identify actions to improve the LFE process. And the fourth factor here is that the LFE process should have some key performance indicators which should be used to give an understanding as to how well the LFE process is working. So that summarises the six LFE steps and the factors for each of those steps. This slide shows an example of how the factors influencing one of the steps, event reporting in this case, were used as a basis for the development of a diagnostic question set. As the slide shows, the factors form the basis of questions for two groups within an organisation. The workforce, who are those individuals directly involved in production or maintenance activities at the workfront, and specialists, individuals expected to have an elevated understanding of the whole LFE process and its intended outcomes. The slide also shows that whereas some factors have a single question, other factors have more than one question. For example, when considering the scope of a reporting system, there is one question about whether the events to be reported are formally defined, and a second question about whether people are trained in those definitions. Where there are multiple questions for a factor, the analyst would average these in determining the rating for that factor. So let's talk for a minute about the application of the survey. My proposal is that it should be administered as an online survey and participants should rate each of the uh, statements or questions uh, on a five point Likert scale with at one end strongly disagree and at the other end strongly agree. Uh, both specialists and Workforce should be analysed separately and as you can see on the example here you can then do a, a comparison on the same radar plot of the two groups and see where the differences lie. Um, the example here is a radar plot for learning potential but in addition to that we can also create a radar plot for each of those six steps and there's an example of that on the next slide, so we'll see that in one minute. It's also my um, proposal that within an organisation, you'd want to repeat this exercise over time, perhaps annually um, or, or more frequently if you are doing a particular initiative to try to improve learning. Um, in line with Holnagel's um, opinion on how RAG would be used, I don't think this could be used for comparison of different companies, particularly if they're very, very different companies. Um, but certainly within one organisation or with one company, you could um, probably quite easily compare operating areas or business units and try to see where the differences lie and use strengths in one area to help learn from to build strengths in other areas. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, the analysis can be carried out for each of the six LFE steps so that you can see a, a good breakdown of um, what are the factors in a particular step which are contributing to a particular strength or particular weakness. In conclusion, the literature supported my initial view that the process industries do not learn effectively from events. This highlights an opportunity for them to improve their learning from events performance and eliminate future incidents. The research found that process safety approaches are rooted in the safety one paradigm 
highlighting a possible opportunity to improve learning from events by adopting a more contemporary approach. However, learning from events is a complex process and making improvements requires knowledge of which aspects to target. There are no widely available tools for the process safety industry to utilise to help them in this regard. Combining a knowledge of the factors impacting learning from events, which my research identified, with a gap approach, within the framework of the LFE model, which I established, has resulted in a survey which can be used by organisations in the process industry to assess their potential to learn. The survey represents a tool which is ready for application within process industry organisations and provides a novel way for those organisations to assess their potential to learn. And that is all I have for you today. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation.